Now, for those of you who don't know, the well-established ties between Cuba and drug trafficking, there's many. Um, for example, you can go there and pay a certain amount of money, and they kind of make you a saint in one of their religions, uh, medical religions, I'm not even going to say which one. You guys can look into it if you want. But you can go there, become a saint. As well as, of course, the ties during the 80s of the uh, geographic location they have with the United States made it a very favoring target to run fast boats in from Cuba, the Caribbean, into Florida, of course. Now, in 97, the Mexican government made a formal solicitude to Cuba asking for information about the movements and activities of Lord of the Skies, Senor de los Cielos. Now, at the end of the day, he ended up using this actual island of Cuba as his base, supposedly. That's where he disappeared to as well, which is the third and last link as far as this story goes in Cuba. But this is where it starts to get juicy. You see, Amado Carrillo Fuentes um, has been shown in lots of movies, even the, one of the Johnny Depp, uh, Once Upon a Time in Mexico. He's the, he's the bad guy they're trying to portray in that movie, the cartel leader. Now, with that being said, we also have Netflix uh, producing something as well that has to do with him. Now, what's interesting about that is in this Netflix production, um, you can see he has an affair with a Cuban woman named Marta Venus Caceres. Now, according to the information that was given from the Cuban government to the Procuraduría General Público, which is like the Mexican FBI, um, Carillo Fuentes, Lord of the Skies, was in an active relationship with Caceres. And he even showed her off to a lot of people he knew, like he'd invited to dinners and the parties, which is something he didn't do with other women. Um, he was very secretive, but with her, it was, it was different. Now, right now, they look at what he got done as far as actual amounts, and they don't have any idea uh, as far as how much dope he moved into the United States. But what I can say 100% is there's no way he could have done what he was doing on the scale he was doing it with jets, you know, airplanes. Excuse the dog snoring, guys. But he's snoring sheets. Now, he was worth enough money that he could have disappeared for the rest of his life. And what's crazy is his lookalike was a federal police officer. Yes, he had a body double. 
and his body double coincidentally disappeared the same day he did, along with the surgeons who were in charge of his operation that many say put the doctor's face onto his. But no one can tell because those two surgeons who were there ended up in 55-gallon drums, I think filled up with concrete, if I remember correctly. So, is what it is. But, what we can look at is the Lord of the Skies traveled to Cuba on lots of occasions. Uh, the last few times he went was supposedly, you know, to solidify his stay in Cuba and what was going to be his future there. Now, according to many people, Carillo Fuentes ended up having a second wife and a daughter on the island as well that isn't publicly known as far as names or who it is. But there's actually a Mexican government official who was telling somebody from the Miami Herald, the newspaper, that the Lord of the Skies ended up in a huge house that was protected by the Cuban military and was situated in the neighborhood El Velado. And this is in Havana. And according to this information, you know, the DEA supposedly knew about a lot of this. But they couldn't get to him just like they couldn't get to Castro like they wanted to. Um, it's just some places are out of their reach, I guess, if you want to look at it like that. Now, I don't know how much you paid the Cuban government to get this type of protection. But smart man, because... He literally went to one place the American government will never go unless it was just an all-out invasion that had nothing to do with him. But as far as them ever being able to extradite him or come for him, and let's see if he's even alive, right? Most people say he died on the operating table in Mexico City. So depends where you are and what you believe. But even if he was alive and he was in Cuba, he's there for a reason. And he has very strong ties to the Cuban government, and they protect him. Now, his compadre is still actually in Cuba. The compadre of Amado Carrillo, which kind of makes people wonder, why did he stay living there in Cuba, out of all places? Is it because his compadre is there with him, and they're just living out for the last of their days? Or what happened there? Now... Many people say, the ones that are more accurate in my opinion, he did survive the operation, he did make it to Cuba, but he is no longer alive uh, just because of the total years and he lived a hard life. Though he would be, like right now, I think in his late 70s, I've got to give you an exact number, but he would be getting up to an age. And the, the common health belief as far as people who are in the know is that he did die by a natural death later on. Um, so he ended up living to an old age, being a grandfather, having several families, and living out his days in the island paradise of Cuba. I'm not saying any of this is positive. In fact, this is one of the most evil people, cruel people, scumbags that I've ever known to exist. And yes, I just called the Lord of the Skies that because he instituted violence on women as far as hunting them down like in a sport and monetizing like as far as making money off that and then if that was enough he taught this to his children and to other people in his cartel so it was like a mass sport throughout the cartel to go hunt women in Juarez to the point that for those of you who don't know you know, all the women that disappeared in Juarez thousands and thousands and thousands and those are the ones we know about who knows how many tens of thousands we don't know about over the decades um all came from this this guy you know um I like calling some other things but I try to keep it I wouldn't say family positive, like I don't consider this good, something kids should be watching, but I don't put curse words out there either at the same time for in case parents do decide to show their children a clip of something or whatever, they can do so. Now, on the 3rd of July, 1997, at the hospital of Santa Monica, that's located in Polanco, which is one of the more exclusive zones of Mexico City, Antonio Flores Montes showed up to a surgical operating area and met with the renowned Colombian doctor, 
who went by the name Ricardo Reyes. Now, he knew that in reality they were going to be operating on the Lord of the Skies, or Amado Carrillo Fuentes. But when he died on the table right there, supposedly their story, right? There was actual federal agents and they were of course on the payroll you guys um and we have to remember what his body double was a federal agent too and that this guy actively followed him and was still receiving the paycheck from the federal government like he was there at work but he was actually with the lord of the skies or close to him and would do missions or whatever for him like he was him being his body double and the lord of the skies would actually stay in the background you know hidden somewhere safer now they found a heavy presence, supposedly, of anesthetics in his blood. Supposedly, that's what killed him, according to the government. Now, their official story is exactly at 6 in the morning, at 6 on point. In the operating room, in number 407, this is where the Lord of the Skies ended up losing his life. Now, the next day, his body was trans transferred to the funeral home, Garcia Lopez, which once again is one of the more exclusive, if not the most exclusive in the Mexican capital. And from there, they translated, I don't want to say translated, translated, I keep trying to like change it to English and it gets messed up in my head, my bad guys. So from there, they moved him to Culiacan from Mexico City. And after that, they moved him directly to the Valle de Fuerto to be laid to rest. Now, interesting enough, his ID read Antonio Flores Montes, who was supposedly a 42-year-old at the time of his death from Zacatecas. So he had plenty of extra IDs and other identities out the wazoo. Uh, that's why this guy was so hard to trace and put anything on because he was smooth as far as keeping a low profile for the American government. They knew he was there, they knew what he was doing, but he wasn't openly flaunting wealth in their face and causing them problems constantly. He understood that violence is bad for business when it comes to fighting, of course, when it comes to killing women, apparently no, because people don't even notice when you're just disappearing them. But when you're having gunfights out in the middle of the street, people notice. And bad for business, and he understood that that caused the tension of the American government. And that's what led to him being so successful in the world of drug trafficking was the fact he understood that. Now, in those days, right where he died, there's also the disappearance of Comandante of the Judicial Police, Jose Luis Rodriguez, also known as El Chiquilin. And people say that's tied into this too, all right? Um, the writer Jose Alfredo Andrade Bojorquez in his book, Desde Nuevo Lato, Vengo, he actually does a good biography of Amaro Carrillo Fuentes. And if you guys would like to learn more or read more, I heavily suggest that he does a really good job and actually goes more into the disappearances that are tied into this case. And what's pretty crazy, imagine this, the author also disappeared the same year he dropped that book in November. <laughs>